Winston Churchill's ties to the Jewish people started long before he was born. In 1841, a distant relative, Colonel Charles Henry Churchill, had created the first political plan for a Jewish homeland in Palestine, 50 years before Zionist leader Theodore Herzl. And Winston's father, Lord Randolph Churchill, was widely known and mocked for his circle of Jewish friends. He inspired in young Winston a lifelong love for the people of the Bible. He really believes that the Lord deals with the nations as the nations deal with the Jews. You need to be good to Jews. You need to be good to the Israelis. God will reward you for that. And he really believes that his whole life. That is one of the animating, I'd say, principles uh, for him. Among Randolph Churchill's closest friends were members of the Rothschild banking dynasty, as well as the prominent Jewish banker, Sir Ernest Castle. When Lord Randolph died, it was his Jewish friends who looked after his son. The Rothschilds helped Winston get a job, while Castle managed his finances for the rest of his life free of charge. For the first 30 years of Churchill's life, his connection to the Jews was purely social, but all that changed when he entered Parliament. In 1904, Churchill accepted a seat in Manchester, where a third of his constituents were Jewish. He won them over by opposing a bill that limited Jewish immigrants in Britain, most of whom were fleeing massacres in Russia. That same year, another man arrived in Manchester, a Zionist leader with whom Churchill would share a lifelong friendship, Heim Weizmann, a Jewish chemist from Russia, who later became the first president of Israel. He was instrumental in lobbying the British government for a Jewish homeland, and his efforts resulted in the Balfour Declaration of 1917. At the San Remo Conference in 1920, the British were given a mandate to enforce the declaration and create a Jewish state in Palestine. The man they put in charge of that task was Winston Churchill. Churchill's job wasn't an easy one. During the First World War, the British had already made a deal with the Arabs. Help us defeat the Turks, and we'll give you sovereign rule in parts of Syria. Two years later, the British promised the Jews a homeland further south in Palestine. It was up to Churchill to see that Britain kept both of those promises. So in March of 1921, he set out for Palestine. Churchill arrived in Gaza with the famous Lawrence of Arabia. Thousands of shouting Arabs had gathered to greet them. Churchill was impressed by their enthusiasm only because he didn't understand Arabic, and he had no idea they were shouting down with the Jews and cut their throats. Lawrence, on the other hand, did understand them, but he decided to keep that information to himself. Churchill went on to Jerusalem, where he met with Jewish and Arab leaders. One of his first visitors was Amir Abdullah, an Arabian sheikh with whom Churchill made a deal. If Abdullah promised not to interfere with the Zionists west of the Jordan, the land east of the Jordan would become an Arab kingdom ruled by Abdullah. And in one afternoon, the kingdom of Transjordan was born. Churchill's decision brought immediate controversy. Many Zionist leaders were angry that he had given away three quarters of Palestine to the Arabs, while others saw him as a savior. Years later, James de Rothschild, a prominent British Jew, wrote Churchill that he laid the foundation of the Jewish state by separating Abdullah's kingdom from the rest of Palestine. Without this much opposed prophetic foresight, there would not have been an Israel today. Winston Churchill had just created an entire kingdom for the Arabs, and yet they still weren't happy. Two days later, a group of Arab leaders came to British headquarters in Jerusalem and presented Winston Churchill with a 35-page memo full of demands. Among them 
abolish the idea of a national home for the Jews, establish an Arab government over all of Palestine, end Jewish immigration, and reunite Palestine with her sister states, Syria and Egypt. Churchill's reply was a blunt no on all counts. It is manifestly right that the Jews should have a national home, he said. And where else could that be but in this land of Palestine, with which for more than 3,000 years they have been intimately and profoundly associated? Before he left Palestine, Churchill visited two Jewish communities that deeply impressed him. One of them was Tel Aviv, a flourishing city barely 12 years old. The other was Rishon Letzion, one of the first Jewish settlements in Palestine and the home of a thriving wine industry. They have vineyards and Churchill liked to drink and he thought the wine was pretty good. He thought the women were pretty and he's blown away by what the Jews are doing in Palestine because where the Jews are, he sees green, he sees industry, he sees development, he sees literature, he sees civilization as he understands it. Where the Arabs are, he sees brown, barrenness, nothing, no advance. For the next decade, Churchill refused Arab demands to end Jewish immigration and allowed the Jews to purchase as much land in Palestine as they could afford. As Jewish development increased, so did the Arab riots. And at one point, Churchill even threatened to send a warship to the port of Jaffa to keep the peace. Not only was the Middle East in turmoil, there was also a storm brewing in the House of Lords. It started when Churchill signed off on a Jewish plan to bring electricity to Palestine by harnessing the power of the Jordan River. He saw it as a benefit to both Jews and Arabs, while the British Lords saw it as a Jewish power play. They introduced a motion to abolish the mandate and nullify the Balfour Declaration. One after another, British Lords denounced Zionism as a burden to the British taxpayer and a grave threat to Arab rights. When the House of Lords counted the votes, the anti-Zionists won. 60 to 29. The state of Israel was in danger of being killed before it was even born, and it was up to Winston Churchill to reverse the vote in the House of Commons. To that end, he made a stirring speech answering critics of the Jewish hydroelectric plant. I am told, he said, that the Arabs would have done it themselves. Who is going to believe that? Left to themselves, the Arabs of Palestine would not in a thousand years have taken effective steps towards the irrigation and electrification of Palestine. They would have been quite content to dwell in the wasted sun-scorched plains, letting the waters of the Jordan continue to flow unbridled and unharnessed into the Dead Sea. Britain, he concluded, must keep the pledge that she had given before all the nations of the world. Churchill's speech was a rousing success, and the House of Commons voted overwhelmingly in his favor. But 15 years went by. The Jews were no closer to having a state, and Churchill, now out of office, was powerless to help. In 1937, the British Peel Commission recommended a partition of Palestine into two states, an Arab one and a Jewish one. Jewish leaders reluctantly accepted the idea because they felt it was better than nothing. Churchill, on the other hand, opposed it passionately, and he warned Heim Weizmann that the British government couldn't be trusted. He urged the Jews to hang on until they got all of Western Palestine, from the Mediterranean to the Jordan River. Throughout the 1930s, Churchill's advice was largely ignored. He had been out of the cabinet for nearly a decade, and his beloved home at Chartwell had become a place of virtual exile. 
from Chartwell, he continued to issue warnings about Nazism, calls to build up the British Navy, and advice on Palestine. He spent the rest of his time writing, painting, and working on his house. Churchill later referred to the 30s as his wilderness years. He also sees himself identifying with the Zionists and the Jews in the 30s that he never saw before because he sees that they're alone in the wilderness together. He was out of power. He had reached a very high point in 1929. He was Chancellor of the Exchequer in Britain, which is often the stepping stone to being prime minister. But he doesn't get there. Churchill becomes ostracized in his own party. He's alone in the wilderness. So are the Jews, so are the Zionists. The Zionists in Palestine were seen as a problem. In 1939, the British government issued a document known as the White Paper. It put strict limits on Jewish immigration to Palestine, followed by a total ban five years later. Britain's Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain defended the paper, stressing the immense importance of having the Muslim world with us. If we must offend one side, let us offend the Jews rather than the Arabs. Translation, the British were on the brink of war with Germany, and they needed access to the Arab oil wells in Iraq. Churchill calls it another Munich. It's just the appeasement policy in the Middle East. He gave Sudetenland to Hitler in 38. That's the epitome of European appeasement. In the Middle East, the epitome of appeasement is in the 39 White Paper, which restricts Jewish immigration to Palestine, going against British commitments and basically saying there won't be a Jewish state. For both Churchill and the Jewish people, life was about to change dramatically. Less than four months later, the Germans marched on Poland, and once again, the world was at war. After 10 years in the wilderness, Churchill was back in the cabinet as the first Lord of the Admiralty. A year later, Neville Chamberlain was forced to resign, and the King tapped Churchill to take over as Prime Minister. For the next five years, Churchill focused mainly on defeating the Nazis. But still, he kept a constant eye on the Jewish people. He's very emotional about what's happened to the Jews, actually. Natalie tells the story how Churchill comes up to him with tears coming down his cheeks, saying, look what they're doing to my Jews. He's very upset about what Hitler is doing. So while England is being endangered, he still is concerned about Zion. Now, his main concern during the war, though, is winning the war, no question about it. When the war ended in Europe, Heim Weizmann urged Churchill to declare a Jewish state once and for all and to allow thousands of Holocaust survivors into Palestine. Churchill's answer, for the first time in their history, was silence. Churchill really hides from Weizmann. Weizmann appeals to him, is begging him to come out. He wants Churchill to come out and so taking the, and champion the Zionists, and he doesn't do it. And it's so obvious why he doesn't want to see Chaim Weizmann, because he knows he can't resist him and he doesn't want to see him, and he's ashamed of himself because he doesn't want to do anything for the uh, Zionists right now for political reasons, for personal reasons, and so he doesn't even meet him. It also gets to the power that Weizmann had over him. Churchill was still sympathetic to the Zionist cause, but he had bigger challenges ahead. He was about to meet with Truman and Stalin in Potsdam to decide the fate of the Nazis and to map out the post-war world. Churchill was facing problems here at home as well. His government had crumbled. Two months after the war ended, he returned from Potsdam to find that he had been voted out of office. He brings him back to victory and he gets kicked out of office. He's apoplectic, he can't believe it. Uh, his wife says to him, maybe it's a blessing in disguise. And he says, well, it's really, pretty well disguised. It was on the initiative of His Majesty's government in the United Kingdom that the General Assembly placed the problem of Palestine's future government on its agenda. In 1947, 
the British government announced that they were pulling out of Palestine. A year later, the British mandate ended. And on May 14, 1948, the State of Israel declared its independence. Nine months later, the British government still refused to recognize the Jewish state. So Winston Churchill, now leader of the opposition, delivered a scathing speech in the House of Commons, railing against what he called the government's gross and glaring treatment of the Israelis, and urging Britain to send an ambassador to Tel Aviv. The speech was a great success. And nine days later, Britain formally recognized the state of Israel. Churchill's old friend, Heim Weizmann, now Israel's first president, sent him a telegram of thanks. Churchill sent him a brief reply. I look back with much pleasure on our association. Then he added, in his own handwriting, the light grows. Churchill died at the age of 90. Both the Prime Minister and the President of Israel attended his funeral in London. And throughout Israel, people remembered the British Bulldog who had been a friend to the Jewish people. They also recalled his first trip to Jerusalem in 1921. Together with the chief rabbis, Churchill planted a tree on Mount Scopus to dedicate the site of the future Hebrew University. Then he told the crowd, I believe that the establishment of a Jewish national home in Palestine will be a blessing to the whole world, a blessing to the Jewish race scattered all over the world, and a blessing to Great Britain. The hope of your race for so many centuries will be gradually realized here, not only for your own good, but for the good of all the world. 